Everybody doing okay? You guys ready for a snow day th th Thursday? Mm -hmm. it is. It's it's coming. All right. Like screen. It's not even straight. No, it isn't. Don't wear for a little bit. Well, the anchor point's coming down on one side, so it's. All right. Anybody have anything? Discuss, talk about drugs and sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yeah. It, it is kind of strange, and uh, probably within the next few weeks, and we'll talk about this next couple of weeks. Um, the Hall of Fame ballot for Major League Baseball just came out, and obviously Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, and who else didn't have it? A Rod, um, I think Paul Marrow, the other one. Uh, you'll see a couple of those on one of the other videos. Uh, it's actually probably going to be another C SPAN video. Sorry. Uh, it does get exciting. Um, the video I'll show at the end there's a, there's a congressman from, I think he's from California. Um, he's also, I think, the chair of that committee that sat in front of the Major League Baseball players. I think it was 05. Maybe 06, somewhere around there. Um, and I'll point out, it's a little gripe that I have with them. Um, so I guess the the best way to say it is, if you're going to be chair of a committee and you're going to be questioning people about their conduct and rules and regulations, probably best to know how to pronounce their names and know who people are. That's, that at least makes you look a little bit professional. Um, so it just seemed like he was uh, not up in his homework. <laughs> but uh, we did some of the societal issues with both of these topics. Um, did you see Mark McGuire's statement? No, I haven't. So after after he got snubbed, he's like, "I'm glad it happened. I'm I'm done with people talking about this. Let's move on." And then I was like, okay, that's cool. That's a cool way to take it. And then he's like, I know I did this the right way. I've had the most utmost comment. <laughs> I'm like, sir, what? <laughs> yeah. I don't know he, about that part. Yeah, he is, um, and we'll probably get into this a little bit during the baseball steroids thing. But they, he's probably one of the one of the most humble guys. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think he's very competitive. Mm -hmm. and I think he's super, super wants to get in, the, get in the Hall of Fame, as well as a lot of the other players, too. They can say, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. You know, I just wanted to win. And, you know, but they deep down, I guarantee that they want to get in. Roger Clemens, probably the same way. Um, so, I mean, it's like the it's like it's the icing on the cake for any career, no matter what Hall of Fame, what sport it is. And they're probably not going to get in because of it. Um, and uh, I mean, there's other people that have done other things that aren't in Hall of Fames either. I mean, Pete Rose would probably be the perfect example. Um, so, which I seen a video there about, I think it's Bob Costas, and made a joke. Pete Rose is still not in the Hall of Fame. This segment brought to you by DraftKings. So, and um, there, there you go. Anyway, what are we talking? So, weight loss supplements in accoutrement that come along with it. Weight loss products, products that maybe help you lose weight in certain areas, maybe boost your metabolism somehow, burn fat somewhere in the body, maybe all over the body, boost your metabolism. But why? Why? I guess a philosophical answer to that would probably be, why not? It is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's probably in the tens of billions of dollars per year. Uh, 
not just things that you can ingest, but actual physical products that you use, uh, weightlifting machines uh, or certain devices to train one part of the body, uh, at home training devices, subscriptions, uh, not just maybe for magazines or uh, any type of print media, but it could be social media. It could be subscriptions to maybe weight loss supplements themselves. It could be um, DVDs. I don't know if anybody does DVDs anymore. Let's come kind of old technology now. But all of these products to do basically one thing is for people to lose weight or maybe to keep weight off. Why? I would want to be so driven to lose weight. And most of the time we're talking about fat. There's other people that are going to want to try to lose muscle mass as, as well. And there's uh, could be some athletics, um, uh, certain certain sports, what whatnot, or maybe people that have retired from certain sports that want to lose muscle mass. A lot of bodybuilders, powerlifters, after they kind of retire, they're they're just done. Even football players, they'll go on certain programs to try to lose just overall weight, just not fat mass, but also muscle mass as well. Because so it just doesn't need that bulk anymore. And it can, uh, as you get older and older, it could start to possibly hinder uh, hinder joints and just overall mobility, possibly, not always, but possibly. So. Back. So why why do you think it's so big? The market of it, supplements or products. People want to look hot. People want to look good. Want to look good naked. A line from a movie you probably you've never heard of. People just want to look good. Why do they want to look good? Who cares? Magazines. Magazines. Getting it. Why would you? Why would you? Why else? The way you want to look good? You want to look like somebody else on a magazine? Could make it more money. Yeah, could make more money, depending upon what maybe the job is, or also be an influencer. I mean, a lot of the people on social media. They got the job because of the way they look. And in fact, if you look at magazines, a lot of the uh, a lot of the guys and girls that have gotten maybe jobs as models for their certain pieces of equipment or maybe even supplements, they probably didn't get that way by using that product. They got that way by other means, but because of the way they look. And we'll get into maybe some uh, other ways to fix their body after the picture is taken as well. So let's get back a little bit of a history here. Um, probably maybe heard from, uh, maybe, maybe not your parents, maybe grandparents. Oh, we didn't have fast food. Walked to school uphill both ways, foot of snow, right? All year round. <laughs> so it was different back then. Walked everywhere. We didn't have motorized carriages. Kids do now. We can, uh, or we we ate at the dinner table every single every single night. It was healthy food all the time. Every time there was no <laughs> bad food. Right. Usually there's some embellishing going on when grandparents or whoever says that kind of stuff. Normally, because. Uh, even my grandparents, man, they could cook some mean fried food sometimes. I'm like, this is what you ate when you were a kid, is just as unhealthy now as it was in 1940. So it's probably not a good example there. So um, they did walk to school, though, a couple miles a day. So it wasn't uphill both ways. I checked. So. What has happened in the past 60, 70 years, maybe? Have we gotten healthier, unhealthier? How do you even define healthier? Because we're living longer. What? Disease population. Yeah. 
diseases. So do we have lower amount of disease today? You know, in terms of the incidence, it may have gone up. We have better ways of detecting certain diseases now. And also we catch it earlier on. So people just aren't dying of what well, we think of sometimes old age and then we just never catch it uh, before they die. And we are living longer in general. Guys, we're still lower. So we're, we do stupid stuff, right? Sometimes anyway. But we are living longer. And at the same time, though, our weight, our physical weight, you know, our mass, if you want to put it in a more scientific perspective, has actually increased. Fat mass is the key component there. So let's take a look at what we have. So these are figures that I use in a few different classes. And uh, keep an eye on a couple different locations. Uh, we got Mississippi and Alabama down here, uh, Louisiana part of it as well, as well as West Virginia too. They seem to lead the country in some of these categories. So, a couple. Uh, so this is from 1985. Uh, this was probably one of the first years they started to actually look at the data in terms of how quote unquote healthy people are, most of the weight. And more specifically, what is their BMI? Anyone know what BMI is? Some, 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 it's close enough. Close, close. So, um, BMI is, is going to be equal to weight in kilograms. Or mass in kilograms, excuse me, divided by your height in meters squared, which is a really odd way of calculating a ratio between your height and weight. There's actually a, uh, a United States version of this uh, to where we use inches as well as pounds, uh, but this is the one I, I tend to know off the top of my head. Uh, if you don't know, if you want to convert this, if you have pounds, what do you got to do to get to kilograms? Can anyone know? 2205. Yeah. What do you do with 2205? Oh, you just times it. Kilograms times pound. Or pounds. Oh, okay. Two kilograms. You divide by two. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Whoops. Come on. 2.2. The meters could be maybe a little more tricky because you say, oh, Five foot ten inches. Well, that's that's an ugly looking number there. So we can convert this to how many inches? Five foot ten is. Oh, see seventy. Seventy inches. If we want to go to inches to centimeters, and we know the conversion there. Conversion there. You're going to multiply by 2.54, 2.54 centimeters per inch. Yep. Centimeters. And then once we got once we get centimeters to get that into meters, we need to do what? How many centimeters are in one meter? So, so divided by 100. That gets you your meters, then you just swear it, do the calculation there. So, if um, maybe you aren't up on uh, maybe some of the categories of what is considered normal weight, obese, and all that stuff. Based upon this number, let's just say it's a terrible looking I'm ter I'm having trouble. Are you struck it out? Give it a caffeine. Well, I'm not used to this whiteboard because there's like a reflection. It's like glass. I don't know. It's, it's weird. Sorry. Uh, normal is 
let's say anywhere from 18 to 25 BMI. There, there's no units behind that. But, well, the units could be kilogram meter squared. But, uh, you say 18, 25 BMI. And uh, then overweight, basically the 26, 30, these aren't exact numbers, it's actually 25 point, it's 25 point uh, nine to, so 25.1 or 29.9. And then we have actually a few different classes of what we refer to as obesity. Obese class one, obese class two, and then obese class three. They basically have 31 to uh, 30, 35, and then 36 to 39, and then anything over 40 is considered obese class three. Or, yeah, obese class three. Those are the basic numbers. So it's the, those aren't 100% exact, but just to give you an idea of where some of these are coming from. So we're, for a lot of these, um, they're either looking at the BMI or they're looking at actual weight. Um, 30 pounds overweight for someone who's five foot four. So, and actually, where they're getting this number from is for every pound over, or for every inch over five feet. Uh, I think it was five pounds, is what it should be, which is maybe okay for, um, I guess, a, a, a lower average male, maybe a higher average female, but um, it's maybe about average. So this class also is known as very morbidly obese, which describes the first problem that we have with what we're about to see. What does this term describe? Morbid. Or morbidity, or morbidly. That's about right. Increased risk of. Increased hmm. risk of is it disease or death? Basically, describe disease. Your disease risk. That's why when somebody is referred to as morbidly obese, they are they have a very high increased likelihood of developing some other disease other than just the obesity itself. Heart disease being the big one. Type, one, type 2 diabetes. Artery disease. Increased risk for heart attacks. Increased risk for any type of pulmonary diseases, possibly uh, arthritis being a big one because they're carrying around so much weight that it's putting a lot of stress on their joints. So let's uh, let's go through this. We have no data for anything. Uh, I guess we're kind of black there. Every, every once in a while there'll be a state where there's no data. Uh, the light blue and kind of the, it's the somewhat darker blue. And we'll have more and more shades as we go along here. 1986 started to increase maybe more of the data. That we have for it, and then we go 1988. We're starting to get quite a few of the states that are in kind of the darker blue 10 to 14 percent of the population is considered overweight uh, or even obese, in that case. And a little bit more, let's move along 1989. 1990, now we have the majority of the United States is in blue. Now it's we have quite a few of the states, well, actually most of the states here in the east, uh, east of the Mississippi. Moving along. Ah, we got a new category. Ah, there's our good buddy. 
Louisiana, Mississippi, and you got West Virginia there. I think Michigan's kind of the outlier in, the, in that group, but he was just saying hi, so. <laughs> Before we move on, why do you think this area down here, and maybe even West Virginia, why do you, any possibilities why? Just, and again, you can think out loud if you, why maybe they're increasing the percentage of population that is maybe obese uh, or overweight. Possible reasons. Well, they don't like to move quick with the times. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Move. Just, just moving in general. Possibly. Awesome. We'll get into that. Movement and diet. Any other reasons? Economies aren't as good as the others. Economies are a big one. Socioeconomic status. To eat healthy a lot of times, it, it does cost money. It's cheap to eat at Burger King or McDonald's or uh, even like place like Subway, which is sometimes viewed as healthier, but if you actually look at the total calories, that's in it. Definitely not uh, a good substitution. Now, in terms of maybe some of the quality uh, of the products and some of the ingredients, a little bit better, but certainly not um, in terms of the calorie point of view. And we'll get into calories here in a little while. So, so we're already creating this scenario in these areas where people are becoming overweight and obese, and there could be some issues now with people developing certain diseases. Which we get back to economics. What happens when you have more people with diseases? Where are they likely going? A hospital, the doctor, they're getting treatments done for these diseases. They're put on more and more medications. So that starts to bump up the healthcare costs, not just maybe for that particular individual, but also maybe as a society as a whole. And that's part of the the societal issue that we that we have. And it's just not, uh, I'll show you a graph here later on. It's just not the United States. It, it is the entire world. Um, we've just... Just growing a little bigger. That's kind of part of it. So moving on, I can two, uh, added a couple more states with the blue and more and more of uh, the eastern part of the United States then. And now we have almost half the United States blue, the dark blue 15 to 19% of our population is considered overweight or obese. 1994, Get Alaska in there, 1995 or 96, excuse me. And now we have a new category, target 97. So I uh, got Mississippi down there in Kentucky, Indiana. Uh, over 20% of the population is now considered overweight or obese. You know, that was 12 years from the start of the data. So part of this could be. Um, that the data maybe got a little bit better. Maybe they were able to survey and actually test different people as well, maybe refine the study a little bit. So uh, not to say that all of it was because everybody started to increase weight. I mean, that was the majority of it, but part of it could be because the refinement of the, the data collection. So just keep, keep that in mind. Uh, 98, more and more states in the yellow, over 20%.
So just as a side note, when we start talking about calories, uh, calorie with a big C, calorie with a small C, and then we got this takeout. Can we tell me any differences between them? What, what we're actually discussing here? From just the, possibly the science behind it or food labels or... That's the reason it resets because somebody's probably had to unplug or unplugged it by accident. It's okay. Okay. Different presentation. So all of these are on a food label, but I mean, a calorie is a calorie. There's some differences here, though, at least with one of them. One of these does not belong. Let me know the definition of a calorie. What what an actual calorie is? We hear about it all the time. We see it all the time. So these are somewhat different. This right here, if you multiply this by 1,000, you get either one of those. <clears throat> these two, calorie with a big C or kilocalorie, that's why it's called kilocalorie or kcal. A thousand of them, kilo. That's what's on a food label. So when you see candy bar has 200 calories in it, it's literally 200 kilocalories or 200,000 calories of the small C. That's the scientific calorie that uh, normally uh, think of. Where are we at? All right, 1991, 92, 93, 97, where are you at? 96, 1997, we started to get that new color. There you go. So greater than 20%, 1998, 99, we had again, a good portion of the United States that over 20% of its population was we're obese. Um, and then 2001, we get a new color. Uh, new color representing obviously a higher percentage. So 25% Mississippi. And we get more and more orange and more and more yellow even as we move along. And same thing, 2004 increased quite a bit more so, and then we have a new category in 2005. Again, with three, three states that I mentioned before the slides. 
over 30%. So almost a third of their population is considered overweight or obese. And there you go. One of my theories is that maybe some of you have seen this before, or have seen me talk about it. Part of this is probably because we have a big chef in the middle, middle of the United States. We have a split. There's his leg, his torso, we got his belly there, his head, there's his nose, there in Iowa. And Mia Florida, that's his hat. And Kentucky is his pasta bowl. There you go. So big chef in the middle of the United States. So that's probably the reason we were, we were doomed when we actually made the borders of the states. Got a history teacher pointed out in high school, I'm like, no way. That's super awesome. <laughs> Took me years and years to actually be able to use it somehow. So it's one of those pieces of information you're like, I'll never use that. Yeah. Look at me now. Okay. So that's uh, that's kind of where we're at. I don't know if I can remember if that was the last one. Uh, no, we got a couple more years here. We just keep <laughs> adding more and more of the states. So this particular series of graphs ended in, in 2010. Uh, we tried to look for updates to this, but uh, I'm not exactly sure where the professor I got it from, um, the actual link uh, for the updates for this, but it still stands to reason this is, um, it, it appears to at least be a problem, right? We've went from the only a handful of states where, that we had data from was basically no more than you know, 14, 15% of their population was considered overweight or obese. But now we're quite a bit of the United States is 30% overweight or obese. Uh, I believe the numbers at the moment, um, in terms of uh, overweight or obesity, I think average amongst the entire United States is 36-ish uh, is percent. So now, Here's one of, the, one of the issues, though. When we looked at BMI, back to BMI a second. So, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Meter squared. So we got weight or mass in this case, and height. Have you guys seen any problems with how we actually measure if someone's overweight or obese? Normally, when we think of someone that's obese, what do we think they have a lot of? Lipids that are stored. Yes, lipids, fats, that subcutaneous fat, stuff that jiggles, right? That stuff. There's nowhere in this equation that describes that. If they would have done multiple other examinations, which take a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, resources, money being the big one. Some of these numbers may have been a little different. Because if you have someone that is really tall, but is kind of kind of skinny, lanky, maybe some athletes, possibly, uh, basketball players kind of come to mind, it's going to look like they have a much lower BMI than uh, comparative to their overall health and maybe how much fat they actually have. I'll also give you another example. This is kind of an extreme example. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger had his top bodybuilding weight, height of his career in bodybuilding. He was approximately 35 BMI. So if you see a picture of him, Back then, he was certainly not obese. Uh, now, he's gained some weight since. He's uh, what is he, 75 years old or something like that. So, I mean, he's put on a little bit of weight, but he still works out every day. So, um, he's probably the fattest he's ever been. Uh, and he's in his 70s. God, if he was fat right after he was governor of California, he's like, oh, yeah, that. Yeah, he was, yeah. yeah. And he's like, I've got to get back to the movies. That was probably stress. I don't know. <laughs> That's probably true. I never want a job like that. That'd be terrible. So I think that this data is great causation that a sugar tax works. What's that? That a sugar tax works. 
You just have to put a 50% sugar tax. California, New York, they have it. They're the skinniest people we got. <laughs> well, you got Hawaii there, too. Well, uh, everybody's surfing. So. <laughs> well, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's the other part of it. That's the other part of it. We always think about the food and the terrible stuff that we put into our bodies. All the crappy things that we uh, go and pay for to munch on. But there are some other things that could be at play here. The other part of it, too, is during this time frame, we, we also started to have a lot of uh, processed foods that had a lot of, uh, a lot of sugar and uh, all, you know, fat in them as well. But we also started to have a lot of foods that, were, that had pre preservatives in them so that they could keep a little longer. And salt is a good preservative. Salt can also increase... The amount of water weight somebody maintains. And that's one of the reasons blood pressure goes up. So some of that weight that they're actually gaining that's contributing to this could be water itself. So people try to counteract that with one supplement. You wanna know what that one supplement is? From the past again. Supplement used to counteract water weight gain. Diuretic. Diuretics. And caffeine or coffee, just in general, is, uh, I guess decaf probably doesn't have as much diuretic effect as caffeinated. But ca coffee is used a lot of times as a diuretic. And because people say, well, I drink coffee, then I you know, got to go pee right afterward. However, studies show that it is not a very good diuretic. It's, it's a very mild diuretic. If you were to take, so this is, I think, 18 ounces. If you drink 18 ounces of water within an hour, you're probably going to have to go to the bathroom. You drink 18 ounces of coffee, you're probably going to have to go to the bathroom. Is there much of a difference in terms of the volume of urine output? Not much. Uh, it's very, very little difference, if any. So um, it's, again, a very mild di diuretic. Um, people still use it for it. Uh, good diuretic. Uh, that actually does work, and there's actually a mechanism in the kidney uh, that inhibits this specific substance, inhibits the ability for fluid to be brought back into the bloodstream in the, in the kidneys. So but drink too much of it, you might die. Alcohol. There you go. So alcohol is a diuretic. It works really well. What's the mechanism? Hit us with it. Uh, so it, it <clears throat> so it inhibits antidiuretic hormone, which is yeah, oh, yeah. There you go. Uh, and I think it also inhibits. There's a there's another hormone there. If you're interested, the aldosterone, basically just two hormones that help to uh, bring water back into the system to to maintain our our water mass within our bloodstream, so that we can use it for sweating purposes and lubrication and all that stuff. So we don't become dehydrated. Uh, but it does help to inhibit that as well. So, so what do like uh, EOC fighters and bodybuilders use when they take diuretics? There, there's probably some other ones in there. There's, uh, I would imagine a lot of them are probably like plant based, maybe a little more powerful than than caffeine. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. There, there, there just put a dip in and just start spinning. So some, some, some people, that's what they've actually actually done. That's, uh, strangely enough. <clears throat> However, some of that stuff can be dangerous. Obviously, if you become dehydrated, <laughs> it's not a good thing. Um, that's why there's some regulations in place amongst all sports now. Uh, high schools uh, and even like, peak sports and colleges, you know, there, there was a time and place where uh, coaches would make their athletes earn the water. And that became a problem, especially in places of hot environments. Um, South Texas was, was one as well. In fact, there was, a, there was an incident where I lived down there. Um, there was a band member, I believe, that died. The, the band director would not let them go get water. I mean, it was, there can't, 
Some of them are carrying heavy instruments, and they're also wearing maybe not the best um, breathable clothing. And um, yeah, so that was the, the biggest issue. So, uh, anyway, let's go on. Uh, so rankings, most of these countries. So how, how do we uh, stack up amongst the, the rest of the world? So there we are. Uh, so when it says both, that means male and female. Oh, there's a self ad. All right. Sweet. Sweet. Oh, boy. So uh, I'll put this PowerPoint up on uh, Blackboard so you can have this link. And... Uh, you can see the see the countries there. So we got this kind of band of countries here that are, I guess more in this area, less than ten percent. Another one? Oh my goodness! Less than ten percent of their population uh, is uh, considered overweight or obese. So, oh my goodness, we got more and more ads. Maybe you don't want to click on the website. So it goes into uh, BMI and the actual numbers here. Again, the the issue is what what type of people are they measuring? Are they measuring if they're measuring a whole bunch of athletes? That may not actually bode real well because if you have somebody that's even not just a bodybuilder who has maybe eight percent body fat, but even just a football player, or whoever it is that has more muscle mass, and we're talking females as well. Female athletes are going to have a higher BMI than their counterparts that are not athletes. So. So for each one of these countries, you can actually hover over them and uh, get the actual rate. So we got Brazil there. Let's look at the U.S. So obesity rate, 36.2. Uh, female is about 37, so we're about, about the same there. Um, so uh, BMI, actual numbers, so roughly 28. So that's eh, on the cusp of... Obese, the average being obese, so that's pretty high. What about our neighbors to the north? A yeah, little better. A little better. <coughs> but when you actually look at the, at the numbers, yeah, still average population still considered good for the weight. Normally we don't think of, the, think of it this way. We think, oh no, the United States is the fattest country in, in, in the world. End of story. But it's not necessarily the case. And that we're the only country that has problems. We're not. We're not the only country. Um, in fact, I think in the early 2000s, well, even the 90s and then the early 2000s, the U.S. did lead that category. We were the fattest country in the world, the highest population, uh, being overweight or obese. Uh, but we were overtaken by other countries as well. And I think for a while, um, the United Arab Emirates was actually no, number one. Um, some of those countries in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and that, I, I think were actually pretty high as well. One thing that you'll, you'll see a lot of times, not, not all the time, but some of the richest countries, getting back to economics, some of the richest countries tend to be the heaviest, tend to be the most overweight the most obese. We have it good. We have all the fine restaurants. We have um, what's the what's the, the the food service people bringing your food uh, Grubhub or is that is that what that what it is Grubhub that's something yeah I, or I, I or, no. What, what? You're in the Grubhub, is what you're saying, or DoorDash. Or... DoorDash, there you go, Door, DoorDash. We, we don't use it because we, wife and I looked at what we can get. Subway, yay, that's the only restaurant we can get. So um, we can have things brought to our dwelling. We don't even have to walk outside the door to go get something anymore. We just call somebody or... Text it in, or uh, you know, go to the website or whatever is in the app, and there it is. Pay them a tip. So we don't have to walk anywhere to get our food anymore. Some of these other countries might have to. Th 
this actually, when I found this, this actually kind of surprised me. I, I thought there'd be a lot more kind of in this area here. Uh, the, the, I mean, it looks like there's quite a few in the middle there. I don't think there's any to the super extreme. So, but you can kind of see it there. What is that one? South Sudan. No, they, okay, they don't have any data. So, um, so there you go. So obesity growing is a global concern. 2.1 billion people. 2.1 billion. It's a third of the population of the planet. So again, why is this problem not just in the United States, but okay, we're getting heavier. We have better health care. I wouldn't say, I'm not going to say paying for it, but I'm just saying the actual care itself is better than what it was 20, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. So we're able to treat diseases better. People are still living longer, even though this is happening. Now, there might be some small dips here and there with uh, longevity and um, mortality uh, rates and stuff. But in general, we are living longer, even though this is happening at the same time. So we'll go back to the original question. Why do people want to take supplements, spend their money on infomercial weight loss equipment? What's the problem? That's probably the answer. There's probably multiple answers to it. That's the that's really the answer that we're trying to go for. We have this problem that we think, well, at least we think is a problem. From a health point of view, maybe from an economic point of view, it's an issue. And people are trying to solve it. Any questions on this? Any, any pulse there? Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Ah, all right. So, mentioned the calories, right? So that we know what we're dealing with here in terms of we gain, we loss, all this stuff. We have three ways in which we burn these calories. Three ways. Generally, the majority is going to be down here, which is resting metabolic rate. So, just enough to keep you alive, essentially. So, it's just there. If you just laid in bed all day, your resting metabolic rate, your activity throughout the day doesn't have to be exercise, structured exercise. It can just be getting up, walking, even just moving your thumbs on your phone. Any activity that you do. And again, when I say resting metabolic rate, I literally mean you're laying in bed, you're not moving at all. all right? Maybe your eyelids a little bit. That's about it. Uh, so activity is a good chunk. And then we also have thermic effect of food. Even though we are gaining calories as we eat food, we're also using some calories. We got to go through metabolism. We got to break that food down. We have some absorption across membranes and stuff. And a lot of that uses calories for it to happen. So part of our uh, daily calorie output is going to be actually eating food. So it's kind of nice. So you could get into some scenarios where a food that you eat is actually maybe burning more calories than what you're ingesting with the food. So maybe something like celery or something like that. Speaking of celery, this is a, a point that I, I also want to make too is because we have, have supplements, there are some scares that happen because people will see a product or an ingredient in either food or a supplement, and it freaks them out. 
How many have ever heard of the the phrase, or I guess the, the recommendation, if you, if you can't read it, don't put it in your body? Yep. Yeah, everyone's probably heard that one time or another, whether or not you remember it or not. I, I don't know. But I remember thinking, there's some things that I have trouble pronouncing in terms of the actual chemical uh, name for some of the products, even some of the vitamins, and they're still good for you. So it's not the deep to not take it. So celery is comes from cellulose. That's what it's made mostly of is cellulose. It's a fiber. There was a scare, a scare in that there was some outrage because there was a um, there was a story on I can't remember if it was. I think it was like NBC. Parmesan cheese. Put on your spaghetti. Well, they found out that there was some filler in the Parmesan cheese. A lot of it wasn't even cheese. Because the company needed to make more money, so they just put less like, <laughs> cheese in it. Because cheese because it, dairy was getting expensive. So they filled it with some cellulose. People freaked out. Because the news people <laughs> said, well, it's wood fiber. Yeah, trees are also made of cellulose as well, but celery is also made of cellulose. So that's essentially what they were putting into the cheese, the, the, the Parmesan cheese. Anyway, that's so sometimes when you hear about supplements, oh, I can't believe they're putting this in there. Sometimes it's just as a filler. It's just a natural substance. Um, the general population can freak out about it if it's worded in the right way, but also politicians can freak out about it as, as well. Uh, I don't know if any of that come up in any of the hearings or anything, but um, you know, most of the time they try to stick with the, the science behind some of the major ingredients that could cause some major problems. So, Okay. We have this. People want to lose weight. <clears throat> How's it happen? Magic? Can we break it down into a simple equation? Maybe. In fact, we can. <sighs> Let's look at the calories, or I'm going to refer to it as KCAL. KCAL out, oh, no, KCAL in versus KCAL out. So the amount of calories that you're ingesting, and that is for food, could be any, possibly even supplements. <clears throat> Protein supplements could have some calories in them. And it could, um, could be drink. In fact, that's sometimes where some of the problems uh, arise from people getting additional calories and starts to add up over time, or you know, maybe drinking pop or a bunch of sugary gain raid. Even though some of those companies have gotten better in, in the recent years about putting lower calorie uh, substances in their drinks, so that people aren't um, ingesting as much. Anyway, KCAL's in versus KCAL's out. And KCAL's out can be any number of these. You could increase your metabolism. Could increase your activity, maybe increase the thermic effect of food, but then that's you get diminishing returns there. If you eat too much food, you eat too many calories. So that's you don't want to be doing that. You want to get a good balance there. But the other two, we can change. Which one do you think is going to be able to uh, change more efficiently, more or I guess e more easily? Activity. Yeah, activity. We can just simply be more active. We can move around more. We can be more intense with our activities. We can go longer with our activities. And activities can be literally anything. Any movement of the body can be the activity used to increase this. It doesn't have to be you go on a five mile run and maybe increase the 10 miles and 15 and 20. 
it can just simply be, instead of being a normal professor and sitting up here like this and talking, you have to pace because you're a dweeb, right? <laughs> so any activity of moving the body is going to increase the core output. You can increase the resting metabolic rate naturally. They want to know how to naturally do it. Go out in the cold. You could go out in the cold. That may help a little bit with shivering, but then you know, I don't know how long it lasts. So that one's probably not a good long term solution. <laughs> Muscle mass. In fact, there, there's actually two camps within uh, exercise physiology. There's a group of people that think that, or believe strongly that aerobic or that those kind of long distance exercises are much better for losing weight. And then there's some that say, well, you can have maybe a little bit of both, but try to at least concentrate on some way of building muscle mass because that's actually going to help boost metabolism and that's going to help to burn some of the calories even at even at rest uh most often building a little bit of muscle mass is going to help at least at the beginning anyway so but then, again any activity doesn't matter so if someone wanted to maintain their weight what do you think they had to do if calories in and calories out what? Isocaloric. Isocaloric. Oh, that's a cool word. I don't think I've ever used that before. Isocaloric. Do you know what isocaloric would be? So you are. Oh, man. Maintain. Just like a four-letter word to trainers. Maintain weight. Keeping the same weight. Calories in, calories out. This doesn't have to be counting individual calories every single day. I mean, you can, but as long as it just generalizes throughout the week, uh, even, even the month, somebody should be fine. All right. What would happen if we had K cows in greater than K cows going out? If you bring in more calories than you are burning, what do you think would happen? There's going to be some tissue increase. You're increasing some sort of mass. It doesn't have to be fat, it can be muscle. It can be possibly other tissues as well, but those are the, kind of the two major tissues. But there is some mass gain. There's some weight gain along with that. Some of this depends upon what the actual uh, training is and be some hormonal things there. And then the... Yeah. Are less than the K cows going out? What do you think? Oh, I'm gonna be sad. Sad, grumpy, grumpy, grumpy super hungry. Depending upon how much difference that is. No, it's always gonna if be sad. If it's that, then it'll be fine. If it's, if it's that, then yeah, terrible. So there's going to be a decrease in mass of either muscle mass or fat mass. Again, it doesn't have to be fat mass. A lot of times it will be because that's the, um, the body will take away some of the fat mass. It's a good storage form of energy, takes it away. It's the only way that we are going to lose weight is if we have that equation in the body. It's the only way. There are going to be influencers. There will be um, people with products uh, that are trying to sell products 
<clears throat> that are going to say, oh, no, well, I actually, and, is that, and they start talking about hormones and all this other stuff. It's like, yeah, the hormones increase or maybe certain hormones decrease, and it leads to this. That's what happens. They will say, well, if you eat after a certain time of day uh, or eat a certain time in the morning or wait till afternoon, it all leads to that. Oh, it is. It's physics. Did you did you ever look at that? I don't know if I told you last. Oops. Oh, look at you, dude. Mm. Uh, that Wee Woo or whatever, that new FDA approved medicine. Oh right. no. So they did. So they did a study actually over years because it's FDA approved. Oh. They took the venom from a Gila monster. Okay. Yes. And they synthesized it. And you have to start super low. We're talking like, what's the little weird backwards G sign? Like NAML or nanograms or whatever. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Microgram, micrograms. You start with literally like two micrograms and work your way up to like some very insignificant amount. But like you're literally poisoning your body and the mechanism of action makes it to where you can't store body fat. So they had people not change their diets, still eating like fat pieces of shit. And they still lost 12% of their body fat. On average, that's average. I mean, some people lost more, some people lost just a little less. 12% of their total body mass. So not changing how they ate. Any side effects? Oh, of course. Yeah, 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 Gastrointestinal, yeah. heart palpitations. Oh, it's awesome. There you go. It's going to be on black market. It's so expensive. It's literally like $1,000 a month. And that is usually the problem with stuff that works. It'll work. There's usually a caveat to it. Steroids, we'll see with ephedra. Uh, there, there's a couple that do work that eh, maybe not so much side effects. Uh, creatine uh, is one of them. Uh, even protein supplements for the most part. Um, but a lot, especially a lot of weight loss supplements, because a lot of them are, I mean, you're trying to boost your natural metabolism a great amount. Uh, and pretty quickly, and your heart rate goes up, and you start affecting the central nervous system, and the communication between your brain and your heart becomes a problem. You can start to have heart palpitations. You can start to have heart murmurs. You can start to have fibrillation, which is basically the heart just keeps on beating very, 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 very quickly, which can lead to death, which is actually what happened to uh, a baseball player, which led to or one of the reasons that it led to the hearing in 2003. So, yeah, that's usually the problem is there's a major side effect. And normally it's um, either heart condition or death. <laughs> usually where it ends up. So, but I, I will say this, and, and I've, I've talked about it a lot with other uh, people who lived in my time <laughs> in the 1800s, right? Uh, back when ephedra was legal and, I mean, you could, you could pick it up. And, I mean, there was no age limit. You go to GNC and pick it up. 16 years old, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that stuff worked. I mean, you could feel it. You now you took two pills every couple of hours or every four to six hours or something like that. Um, but if you took three, and if you mixed it with caffeine, even more so, or there were supplement companies that actually added a little bit of caffeine in with it, which helped to increase the amount of heart rate increase. You're forgetting about the aspirin too. It'll clean your blood out a bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was it was good stuff. Okay, switching gears a little bit. So we have the calories in, the calories out. All right. So let's let me let me, let me ask you a question. Why? Again, you can think about this in the back of my mind. Why would someone want to lose weight? What would cause them? To try to get to that bottom equation, even though they might not be thinking about that equation per se, but they want to lose weight. And they could take supplements or buy little gadgets. And I call them gadgets because gadgets tend to admit maybe some sort of different emotion other than equipment or machinery. Right. Even though they are a machine and they are a piece of equipment, um, they are little little gadgets. Um, a lot of the gadgets that you'll see 
tend to deal with losing weight in one particular area of the body. Probably the most common area is here, the midsection. So the concept is if you do this exercise with this piece of equipment, this ab exercise with this piece of equipment, you'll lose weight in the abs. You have a six pack, beautiful washboard stomach thing. However, that is known as spot reduction. So you're losing it in one spot. That does not work. You lose fat, you lose it everywhere. Now there are Based upon genetics, some people are going to gain fat and carry it in certain other places. Some maybe around the hips more, some maybe around the gut, some more maybe around the chest. Just depends upon and their genetics. And they could lose it in a different way. Right? They, I mean, you could look at their face and be like, wow, they gain some weight. You can see it in their face. And then once they lose weight, you can see it in their face. If their face just gets slimmer. There are other machines that uh, are part of this as well. Anyone to hit this lady? First letter. S. Sarah? Nope. Cindy? Nope. Yeah. Almost sounds like you're going to go over Ted. Okay. This is a lady by the name of Suzanne Summers. Uh, she was actually two hit sitcoms, I think. Um, Three's company. This is going to go. That's going way back. Uh, and step by step, back in the nineties. So she promoted this device. What was the, the thigh master? So it was basically an adductor. So you just squeeze in the legs for it. Right? You lay on your your side and do this. So, doing this to the thigh. And the concept was, and the promotion was that females will get nice looking thighs. They do this. They'll lose weight around the thighs, buttocks. But that's not necessarily how it happens. <clears throat> now, will they tone those muscles? Quote unquote, tone those muscles, work them out? Sure. It just might be covered with a layer of fat. It's the same thing with the ab machines. You'll have a six pack, just might not be able to see it. Yeah. What were some other ones? Oh, there we go. I think this is called the ab rocker. Um, and by the way, these two ladies, I, I don't know who this is, it's just, a, just another model. I, I don't know who that is. Um, Again, all these models, they probably got the job because of the way they look. Even Suzanne Summers, she probably used the device, but she's probably also making some money, too. So she was in between sitcoms, and she had to make some money. So there you go. Uh, any number of the infomercials with the ab machines, they all, again, try to do the same thing. Uh, hit the abs from maybe a different angle. And you know, I'm sure there's people with basements or closets or attics or garages or barns full of ab machines that were maybe used for two weeks and put away and collected dust. And, uh, so a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff online. And again, late night infomercials. That was, that was the big thing. I, I think there's still some of them that are around, uh, but back in the eighties and nineties, that was, that was really what, what people had. Um, Now you just probably browse this stuff on Amazon, yes. And some of my favorites, ab belts. Help you lose weight in the abs. Again, spot reduction. So the concept here is you put a belt around your abs. Uh, most of them had some sort of electronic device. That's what these little gadgets here are on the front where they would contract the abs. So you could be sitting at your desk Basically doing crunches all day, all day long. <laughs> right? So you're contracting the abs. So you were working out while you were doing work. 
which still doesn't sound like fun. Yeah. Does it work? You're contracting the abs. You might quote unquote tone them a little bit. You're working them out. But did they lose weight in their abs? Maybe a little bit. Maybe they're burning a few extra calories per day. But even to strengthen the abs, probably won't work it anyway. This is not concentrating on the right motion of the exercise. Not damaging the muscle enough, not causing any type of stress or as much stress on the muscle with that. So, so those are no go either. Uh, I think these were called butterfly abs. So, picture like this. Obviously, this is superimposed. I don't know why they put it like superimposed, but maybe they just kind of photoshopped it to make it look glowy. But then you have someone there with a tape measure. So th this is invoking a lot of different probably emotions, and someone sees this. This is advertising <coughs> one on one. Okay, so one sex sales. So there you go with that. But also you have the device itself and you have someone with a tape measure. So that's invoking, well, I could look like that if I got that piece of equipment. So that's, oh yeah. It's this emotional response that the advertisers are trying to get. I don't know, I can look like that. I need to look like that because everybody's looking like that and everybody's trying to be fit and maintain a washboard stomach. There they are, but a butterfly app. So again, the people that are, the, the models, they probably didn't get the job based upon this. So, it, um, so any type of spot reduction, if you, this is a big red flag, any type of spot reduction devices that are advertised, probably not a good idea. Now, not to say, <coughs> Again, they cannot train the abs or whatever muscle group, like the thigh master would be a good thigh exercise, but it's not necessarily gonna reduce the amount of fat in the thighs. That is gonna have to be because your caloric output has increased. That's the only way. And you just kind of have to let nature take its course of where the body is gonna lose that fat. But, I mean, you could get surgery too. That's, I guess that's the other. Other thing that could happen. Um, so there's, the, in a nutshell, the biggest gimmicks. And trying to refrain from showing the tug toner, but um, you know, maybe later at the end. Any questions? Sorry. Has anybody try any of these? No? Well, I'm afraid to say that they tried them. So now they've gone to the next level. You don't even have to work out. So mm -hmm. what you do is you put a little cream on, then you put mm -hmm. this like 17 layer neoprene that's like the knee wraps or power lifters. And people are like, I sweated so much and I need that's all fat. And you're like, no, that was like 18 layers. Of that was, and that's kind of another version of the ab belts is that some of them would actually I mean, they just put a big thick layer of material that is not breathable. It doesn't wick away sweat. It just, you sweat in the stomach. That's it. Yeah. If it's tight enough, you can probably squeeze the organs and it might feel skinnier. So that could be part of it. But now, again, some of that is going to increase caloric output. So if that's also the same time where you're reducing your caloric input, it could cross and get to that bottom equation there, which then causes someone to lose weight and then they attribute it to that product. But instead of buying the product, they could have took the stairs every day rather than take the elevator or park a little bit further away from the door of Walmart. Or they could have actually taken their cart Put it in bin. Excuse me. That peeves. Quick story because I like stories. You might not like it, but 
Tá bom. I can't remember what year it was, probably 93, 94. Saw an infomercial on TV um, for a piece of machinery like this called the Adflex. It's almost like this triangular piece of basic plastic. Uh, when I got it, it almost felt like a cheap plastic. Uh, but it had these bands that kind of strapped to this middle section that went on your stomach. You basically pull pull it up. So you could sit down and actually do it. You could lay down and do it like a normal crunch. You're putting stress and pressure on the abs itself while you were doing this. And they had people there with I mean, it was a half hour long interval. You know, I watched it and convinced my mother to buy it. I don't know what it was, like three payments of $9.99 or something, I don't know. But um, yeah, and just like most of these products, used it for a month or so, and I have no idea what happened to it. No idea. If I find it though, I will, I will bring it in. Probably in a, probably in a storage box on building somewhere. Right next to your tongue and toe. <laughs> yeah. I've done it, yeah, duck dinner. Still trying to find the USA Today that I have with, with McGuire's 70th home run. I, I, I know I have it somewhere and I could not find it. But, but I got some other stuff there to kind of just to show you how big of a nut I was. And oh, <laughs> the, the little ditty that? I don't know what it is. Oh, man. All right. So, again, why is weight gain such an issue? Why do we care? Why no one care? We talked, talked about some of it. We talked about the health issues, and that could lead to health costs. Now, again, we're living longer, so our longevity in general is getting longer. But at the same time, we're increasing our overweight and obese rates. So we have these kind of two confounding ideas or facts, really. Like, well, maybe it's that, okay, yeah, we're living longer, but maybe the other thing is if if we didn't have that much of an incidence of being able to or obese, what would the numbers be then in terms of longevity? Could be in the 90s instead of in the 80s. Well, what's our health span right now as compared to lifespan? And how long are we normally healthy and disease free? Well, I'm not sure on that one. And that's actually a good point. And something to, that I would bring up but is that it would be great to live to 100 years, years of age. For the last 15 years of your life, if you're bedridden, I mean, is that good? You know, the quality of life and the quality of the years a lot of times also matters too. So I think I have to take some of that into consideration. And then I always propose the philosophical question, you know, almost like a thought experiment. You know, if at some point we, as humans, evolved to live to two, three, four, five hundred years of age, would you have the same career for three, four hundred years? Would you be married to the same person for four hundred years? And yes, I've asked my wife that question. She's like, no. <laughs> Thanks. Like, yeah, you're right. I got it. She's like, ah! <laughs> uh, she can't get rid of me. But anyway. So what causes it? It causes people to... Uh, and then we went over the energy balance equation. Again, is there any other way to change it? Other than... Just calories. <laughs> needs to be more than calories coming in. I mean, you could, again, cut off parts of those tissues. Surgeries help with that. And surgeries even help with the calories coming in as well. Lap band surgery, gastric bypass, all that stuff helps with people who are morbidly obese. And in fact, a lot of times when, they're, um, when they want to get that surgery, they almost have to be in that category. 
and a lot of times they want them to be on a diet, uh, they being the, the doctors and physicians, want them to be on diet and good exercise beforehand, which, <gasps> oh my God, diet and exercise, <laughs> no, oh no. Any bottle that you see of a supplement, weight loss supplement, even if it's a muscle, uh, uh, um, a product to gain muscle mass, it's going to say on the side of it, best results with diet and exercise. Almost all of them will have that. Because more than likely, the ingredients actually in there probably don't do anything, for one thing. Or they're very mild in their effects. So they have to put that on there. Because then if people do diet and exercise, they're going to see a difference. Unless it's steroids, doesn't matter. Um, so I think my favorite thing, and I think what should be shown in health class growing up, is this clip from my six hundred pound life, which is my guilty pleasure. I love feeling good about myself. I was thinking, and uh, this—it's literally so ridiculous. This, this, these two sisters are. Like, yeah, when we were growing up, my mom just told us after a big old sugary meal, drink a Diet Coke, and it just it just canceled out. And the doctor's like, and do you think that's right? He's, she's like, I, now I'm starting to think that isn't the case. It, it literally it kills me every time. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. I don't know how that would, how you would come up with that solution. Well, mom didn't know what she was talking about. And that's why education is important. <laughs> that's why I do this stuff. That's why, I, that's why I like my job. Oh, energy balance. All right. So natural weight loss. What's the natural weight loss? Good diet and exercise. Hey, good diet. I could muddy the water a little bit too. Just dieting is not as good as diet and exercise. And just exercising isn't as good as dieting and exercising. So both of them tend to work in conjunction. Now, uh, there are some studies that show, you know, maybe just dieting is more effective than just exercising and vice versa. Um, but, you know, there's some, some variations to some of those studies and really both of them together are kind of nice. Even though there are weight loss regimens out there that it is just dieting. Even though they recommend exercising, such as maybe Atkins diet, um, the, the keto diets, uh, most of the time though people are exercising while they're on them, so it kind of helps. Uh, there was also another one, Nutrisystem. Have you ever heard of Nutrisystem? Yeah, so it was basically meals that were sent to you in the mail. Lose the weight based upon just eating those meals. If you went outside of those meals, you know, eat more than possibly had some issues. And there's my Facebook meme. Which gets into the sociological, sociological maybe, societal problems possibly. Social media. That's always being such an issue. And why would people want to lose weight? And this is what we want to discuss next. So a shameless plug, uh, I, I, uh, one of my hobbies is photography. What you see on social media a lot of times, I, I know this is really, really tough to, this might be a, a shock. What you see is not reality, right? Even a simpleton like me with easy Photoshop, simple Photoshop skills, um, there's the raw picture that I took. There was the edited version, simple Photoshop. And this is just a dead tree or dead trees. So this isn't even a live person made those trees. Well, at least I think it was beautiful. Another one too. Oh man, dark image. Got crappy down here. Um, then change it into something like that. Bam. Soon let's get rid of some stuff. 
What's, pop what's popular now is uh, a lot of these like silly influencer kids selling their Lightroom presets that make mm -hmm. them super veiny and ripped and shit. So instead yeah. of figuring it out yourself, you just like will pay them ten dollars and have all their presets, and you can make yourself look. Oh better. yeah, and there, and if someone knows some some basic Photoshop, I basically did the same thing to this rock. There were parts of it where I took basically dodging burning, you know, about uh, photography and some parts, and some of them I increased the shadows a little bit, made it look a little bit more three D. I did the same thing over there, so just what happens. So, so, some of you may or may not have seen some of these videos, but let's go into at least some of them here. <laughs> oh, there we go. Good, it works. Whoa! Do 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 Thoughts. Am I seeing that before? One more. I don't like how they increase her neck length. That that was kind of creepy. Um, I don't know if they needed to in that, but. <sighs> This one was a long while ago. That was six years. Oh my god, see, this is almost 21 million views on this one. When did this come out? I don't see the date. Anyway, doesn't matter. Now her face a little bit, jaw more structured. Actually, almost looks a little bit like Tom Brady. Yeah, strange. strange. What do you think? Could this cause maybe some issues, weight issues with? Well, this is where the meme with Facebook comes in because if you've paid any attention the past few months, uh, Facebook or meta, whatever they're calling themselves, kind of gone through some issues because there was the whistleblower that came out about some of the data that uh, that Instagram and uh, Facebook had had about maybe some of the issues, especially amongst these girls uh, and even guys too, uh, where they're getting stressed out, which then caused them to possibly even look at it more. And they were looking at influencers and models and people who had this kind of perfect figure quote unquote perfect figure. And it was causing 
eating disorders and maybe um, poor habits and possibly even uh, weight loss extremes, weight loss supplements that were being ingested, maybe diuretics. And again, it's just not females. It does they do target some of that stuff targets females a little bit more than males, but um, on the male side, generally it's the opposite way. You want to get bigger, or you have somebody stand stand there and they take a picture and you increase the contrast and the clarity and all this stuff, and then you get more veins and do yeah, just look more ripped. Uh, if you stand in the right lighting, you're gonna look way more ripped than what you really are. Um, and in fact, that's why a lot of the bodybuilding competitions they have the correct lighting and they're they have the spray-on tans or the or the actual tanning oils and stuff. So it's yeah, I can sometimes do the issue. Any comments about that? Is you know, banning Photoshop from ads? Ban's a weird word. Hmm? Ban's kind of a weird word. Yeah, maybe it's maybe it's a little harsh. Maybe it would be like records when you get to go buy them in the early 2000s at Walmart. Like, this image has been photoshopped. It's over there in the corner. And maybe that's should happen. I don't know. What do you, what do you think? What do you know? Will they have to disclose what's been photoshopped mm -hmm. to how much degree? Mm -hmm. That's all. Or maybe show them a before and after picture. For every advertisement? That would be pretty sweet. <laughs> And this was Photoshop, right? And a lot of heavy software. The filters are getting so much better to where that's usually called AI type of editing, to where you don't have to necessarily learn how to use Photoshop. Just click a button. Maybe pull some sliders here and there, and that's about it. And it causes a perception that somebody is again thinner, they're more in shape than what they really are, and that can cause maybe some psychological um, issues or even just thoughts of man, I wish I could look like that, and I wish I could do this or that, and then it starts going down the road. Well, how do I look like that? Again, they're not maybe thinking about it directly, but this is where they want to be. So they want to buy a product whether it actually be a piece of machinery or one of those uh, gadgets or simply a um, supplement to help them lose weight. I can't remember what this one was. Oh, yeah, the big W2 and file Fed and State for free. Okay, so uh, anyone remember the biggest loser? Yeah, yeah you watch it. Quite a bit. You remember? Oh boy, what was going on? Um, what was there? Rachel Fredrickson. I can't remember. I think it was 24, 20, yeah, it was 2014. I think the that season started in 20, 2013. Right? I don't know if you watched that far back or not. You know when that lost too much weight? Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. So we'll, we'll we'll see it here. And this was this was kind of the moment that people started to be like. Ah. Okay, maybe we've gone maybe a little bit too far. Um, there's a lot of different ways we can we can look at this and this, this, this up. So we probably won't watch all of this, uh, but we the biggest loser who some are saying lost too much weight. Rachel Fredrickson shocked fans when she revealed a body that went from 260 pounds all the way down to just 105 pounds. Did you check? 260 to 105. Sure Their current weight is. It took just a matter of months to get to this moment. After a torturous journey of sweat and struggle, 24 year old Rachel Fredrickson was declared the winner on NBC's Biggest Loser finale Tuesday night. A $250,000 grand prize for a 155 pound weight loss. That some are now saying went too far. The show's trainers seem shocked 
and on social media, an outpouring of concern for her health, some criticizing her for losing too much weight. This is a game show. It's not a healthy model for how you should be losing weight. What we recommend is one to two pounds per week, not the kind of enormous weight loss that she, that she experienced. 60%. What's the difference? It's competition. That's the difference. Her original body weight, the most in the show's history. Like all contestants, she followed a program of rigorous diet and exercise. Constantly monitored by weight loss professionals, but some doctors question the program's safety when it leads to such extreme results. Having a prize of $250,000 to lose weight puts pressure on people to do things that might not be good for their health. As for Fredrickson, now 5'4 and 105 pounds, her BMI, or body mass index, is slightly below healthy. But despite the criticism, the biggest loser stands by their message, stating, we remain committed to helping contestants achieve healthy weight loss and live healthier lifestyles, and to inspiring viewers to do the same. Two people who looked more than shocked at the transformation. Watch that one. So, obviously, the show and the producers are going to put out, no, no, we're all for healthy, and that's whatever happened. It matters whether or not they are actually for it or not. I mean, that's what they have to do. That's just going to be a PR nightmare. So, they're like, well, no, we just wanted to. Have the most extreme weight loss that, that's what helps make us money right being honest wouldn't be <laughs> wouldn't be good for for business and um so there was a, there was a doctor in there that talked about healthy weight loss one to two pounds per week possibly and look at calories approximately 3500 calories is equal to one pound of fat <laughs> One pound of fat. So, if you want to lose one pound of fat per week, how many calories in the deficit would you need to be? A total of 35. How many days are in a week? Seven. seven there you go. So, 3,500 divided by seven equals 500. 500 kcals per day you need to be under what you're um, or, or over what you're bringing in to lose that one, that one pound of fat. So either do this through a decrease food intake or increase activity. Some way, somehow that needs to happen per day for that one pound of fat. So for two pounds, it would need to be a thousand. If you watch the show and you've seen that sometimes they would get on the scale and some of the participants would be eight, 10, 12 pounds below what they were the previous week. Most of the time, some of that was water weight. And also they probably were losing some fat during that, that period of time, which is super extreme. All of the data shows, scientific data, studies of, on weight loss, weight loss in this type of scale and, and um, amount per week, and the anecdotal evidence from the participants in the show show that the faster somebody loses weight, generally they gain it back. Not only that, they tend to gain back more than what they lost. In fact, if you go back to look at some of the past participants, in fact, a lot of them, um, a lot of them gain most of the weight back or all of it. Some of them even gain more back after they were done. So after they left the show, they had no one in their face, no trainers in their face. They had no one there to kind of keep them in line. So now, did they take any weight loss supplements? I have no idea. I would imagine some of that probably went on. Again, they were, they were trying to promote healthy weight loss, but at the same time, they need to make money So because they're a TV show. So they needed to have some sort of theatrics. So what they did... Um, Theatricality and deception. 
So they had the big scale. If you never watch a show, you can go online and look at what they did. They had the big scale. People stood up there, we usually put the shirt off, and scale would go up and down. And so there was the theatrics. And then we got a commercial break right before it revealed what their weight was and how much they lost. The other side of this is that this young lady won, I think, a quarter of a million dollars. If there was a game show, or if someone said, hey, I have a nice suitcase of money right here, quarter of a million dollars, once you get down to 150 pounds by April, you bet your ass I would. <laughs> Some way, somehow, that money would be mine. How I would do it, but start cutting off toes or something. So that's the other part of it. It is a competition. Um, oh, anyway, in the media and just TV and just in, in general, sometimes um, can I add to this? Now, here's kind of a comical one. <laughs> this is really funny. This is this is the only video I could find of this, and it was really crappy because someone looked like they took a camcorder and recorded the TV. Uh, John Cruck was a professional baseball player, played for the Phillies, and I don't know if he played for anyone else. Um, but he, he was kind of a bigger guy, uh, but he was one of the athletes. Uh, Dan Marino was also one that promoted Nutrisystem for a while. John Cruck had one of the best lines in the commercial advertisement for Nutrisystem, the, the greatest. Hopefully, you'll understand it. Friends, there it is. Six second video, five second ad. How about that? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta play it again. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he was honest. Like maybe, maybe I, I don't know. Probably one of the funniest. The base one. Oh my goodness. So uh, let's take a short little break. Oh, that crowd kind of Start to sweat a little bit. All right. We'll start with a Fedra. I this. I just have some of the video on for, for next week. All right, take a few minutes. If I can call myself. Yeah, fed her out of my system. How long are we taking a break for? I'm going to do a good water bottle. Just, just a few minutes. Yeah, I'll be yeah. back in like five. Okay, yeah, that'll be fine.
Liver King here, we just finished blitzing the cow because I'm the liver king and because the liver is king. We're going to take five out. Like what? Done. Looking out. There's another one here. I think it was this one. Liver King here, the Liver Queen, the Liver Boys. This is what we're for our family there today. We got a pound of the raw tart tar. It's fresh from out of ribeye. We got lots of carbs. We have potatoes. We have a, a, probably a pound of rice. We have liver, of course, with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We have bone marrow, Liver King concoction. We have some vegetables. That is a joke. And we have protein shake. This will let me family after dinner today. Sure, yes. Yeah. Liver for every meal. There was one where he had blood. I can't remember which one. Some of my hobbies, I guess. Wasn't there one where he did this, like, just had a bunch of, like, this raw egg glass? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, uh, a buddy had sent me, sent me the link, and he said, that's not a bad way to get, like, 30,000 milligrams of cholesterol. It's just way more. Oh, yeah, there was him eating eggs, fish eggs, straight from, straight from the fish. Pull up the bull testicle one. Oh, there it is. Liver King here. I have 50 fertilized fresh eggs for my farm. I'm about to eat all of these, and I'm challenging you just to do one. Post it to your Instagram, and then we're going to repost some of our favorites. Here we go. And he does this Rocky style, too. Okay, so fifty times. Uh, I think there's roughly three hundred milligrams of cholesterol in each egg yolk. So we're looking at fifteen thousand milligrams of cholesterol. Um, so there, there you go. It's just what our caveman ancestors would have done. Yeah, yeah. This guy's such a <laughs> And we'll talk, we'll, we'll have more of him uh, and others like him. I don't, I, I still, I'm still, I don't know. Okay. I'm still in awe of, this, of, of, of him. He's, all, he's also trying to sell products. He actually owns his own supplement company. Um, he sells, uh, I think, bone marrow. And, uh, I don't know. He does a bunch of stuff with other, other types of products. I, I don't even know. So he's trying to sell a product, and he's obviously a well put together individual. Now the question becomes: Did he get that way because of the products that he sells, or some other means? I mean, there's obviously a lot, a lot of hard work there. I mean, you don't get that way um, just by injections, but um, they may, may, may or may not. Help. So, uh, anyway. But I don't know if some of this he's being serious or if he's trolling everybody. I just wonder. I just, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's entertaining anyway. It's, where are we? Oh, where are we at? Fedra and other stimulants. So let's go. All right, caffeine. Uh, caffeine, again, I've mentioned in the first week, so second week, whatever it was, most widely consumed drug in the face of the planet. Um, it is just a, it's basically a lower grade ephedra, lower grade speed. Or if you want to get to the extreme correlation, it is a lower grade methamphetamine. It's not a methamphetamine, so you're not ingesting a low grade meth when you take it. So that's, that's make that clear. But it has some of the sim at least similar actions to it. 
I mentioned the mild diuretic capabilities of it. Again, you might be able to lose a little bit of extra water, but maybe not too much. There could be some increase in muscle strength, possibly, with it. There's some mechanisms there to where um, there could be some increased force of contraction of the muscles. But that's, it, it's more of a hypothesis than, than anything. So what can it do? What can caffeine do? It's used a lot of times as a weight loss product. It's put in weight loss products. But it's mostly consumed not for weight loss products, but it's for keeping people awake. It's for maybe just almost like a, a social drink. And that's actually the main reason I usually have mine while I'm teaching is I've gotten used to it, where if I don't have it, I feel weird not having a cup of coffee to, to drink out of. Right. Even just having a bottle of water or something, it, it doesn't, it's not right. It doesn't feel right anymore. I have to have the, the bitter taste of black coffee. Right? And it is black coffee. So that's usually, way, usually what happens. So it's a stimulant to help keep us awake or just wake us up, in fact. Some of the studies done on it, uh, looking at does it improve any type of performance in sports? Maybe, maybe. Uh, I don't think it's been banned. Uh, I mean, there may be some organizations that, that have banned it, but it is dangerous at a certain level. 1,500 milligrams, roughly. Your average uh, cup of coffee can vary widely. And again, a cup is six ounces. Cup of coffee is six ounces. So when someone says a cup of coffee, this is actually three cups of coffee. So it's basically a pot of coffee. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not even sure if there's any type of units equating to a pot. I guess it depends upon how big the coffee maker is. Um, <clears throat> but it is a stimulant, and it can potentially help performance in at least one aspect. There was a study, uh, one of my colleagues actually did, uh, a fellow student of mine when I was in grad school, actually, he was a uh, track coach. And he was looking at the differences in, or he was trying to see if the caffeine would have an effect on his throwers, shot putters, both male and female shot putters. And what he found was <clears throat> that there was no, there wasn't really a significant difference in their throws between the caffeine and the non-caffeinated, it was actually gum that he, he was using. So there was no significant difference. That was statistically. When you actually looked at the numbers, there was an increase in like two, two and a half inches of length of throws. Now that doesn't sound like much when you talk about 45, 50 feet. A couple inches in a competition can sometimes be huge. That can, can be first place, third place, or difference between first and fourth place. And the reason I'm statistically insignificant is because you take that big, huge image, a lot of inches and 50 feet. So a couple inches isn't, isn't really that much. So what was the mechanism? Was it the caffeine itself? Well, it was actually theorized, and, and he did some more informal tests later on in the afternoon or evening practice, and they didn't really see that difference. The original study was performed in the morning, like six in the morning. So likely what was happening was the athletes were actually more awake. They were more stimulated because of the caffeine. It's probably the reason for it. There may have been some other mechanisms there with possible increase in force contraction, but likely not. So, uh, there could be some benefits to it for athletes, or there could not. Uh, and if there is, it's probably very small, likely small. Not going to be, you know, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to turn you into Tom Brady overnight. So. It is on the list of WADA banned substances, isn't it? 
It is. But it's, how do they test for it? It's at a threshold above so many. Oh, yeah. So you have to be like abusing it. Well, and here here's the thing too with with caffeine is, man, it is tough. To, it, it's tough to test for because there was actually some studies um, that have some people that have done that got rejected for publication because they didn't actually measure the caffeine in the bloodstream. The problem with that is, I mean, it, it's a process to go through to determine how much caffeine was actually in the bloodstream. I mean, obviously you need to do, you do blood draws and there's actually um, a titration method <laughs> that's needed for it. So and there may be some easier methods, but that's the way they had to do it. So uh, yeah, it's a long drawn process, so. Why are all the drugs that don't work that well so like hard to test for? The ones that just crank it out, they're like, ah, oh, yeah, I can tell. They don't smell it. I don't know. I don't know if it's because, well, I think it's like downstream mechanisms, like this crazy stuff just hits more. So they're probably, <laughs> probably. And I mean, if you look at a Fedra though, I, I don't know how you would have, I mean, you may have been able to test for a Fedra. I know it, it was banned, and uh, I, I think I, I'm thinking the NBA and NFL were some of the first leagues to, to ban a Fedra. I, I think. Um, I think Major League Baseball then did ban it as as well after the pitcher died, and after the uh, as you've seen in the video, there were some other. I don't think the Olympic Committee had banned it early on. Um, caffeine, though, I'm pretty sure it's still used in the Olympics, so perfectly fine. Um, so, again, these are kind of the you can go through, uh, and that's what I was thinking before was oh, I'll go through a whole bunch of lists of supplements and we can look at them. Like, oh, that's a gun, that's a normal, normal lecture. That's, that sometimes you can get bored as you get into the hard, nitty gritty science behind it. But these are the two, two big ones. In fact, and I mentioned before, oh, we add caffeine to the ephedra, man, it really worked. Yes, in fact, the supplement companies actually added a little bit of caffeine sometimes with the ephedra to have those added effects. And in the video that you'll see, um, I will probably won't get to that part, but there's a, a physician, a doctor there, uh, that actually studied some of the stuff. He's a cardiologist, I believe. And he mentioned that you have four markers. So you have the ephedra plus the caffeine. And that's enough to increase heart rate. You're increasing blood pressure. You're increasing just the central nervous system stimulation of those mechanisms, of the cardiovascular mechanisms. Could increase some issues, especially if you get too much of the combination. Uh, could cause some heart palpitations, again, heart issues, and possibly even death. Okay, well, what else is happening? But this wasn't the entire equation, usually. I mean, we've got a lot of equations today, don't we? This wasn't the, the entire thing. You also had exercise along with it. Most of the time, people were, that were taking this weren't just taking this and not doing anything. A lot of them were athletes or people trying to lose weight. So they were doing this, exercising, and on top of it, they could have been dieting. So they could have been decreasing the amount of food that they're getting in their diet and increasing uh, or decreasing the amount of fluids that they were getting as well, which was confounding the problem. So all of that combined, was causing major, major health issues with some people. Others, they, they were fun. The other part of this, too, and there, there's a lot of parts to, to this, because, and that's where you can't just say, well, it was a Fedra. Fedra is terrible. And that, there's other things that are going along with this as well. You can add another one, too. Underlying conditions. 
some people don't know that they have a heart condition. Some people don't know that they might have a, a, a valve problem or they might have a hole in their heart that isn't warm enough. They just don't know. But then they start having some of this going on up here that they're doing voluntarily. And that's going to start to exacerbate any problems that's going on with that. If they have any liver problems, if they have any kidney problems, you're going to start to see some major issues along with that. So that was the problem. Now it was sparked in a couple of different ways where people wanted to lose weight for whatever reason it could be. And they took the ephedra, maybe had some caffeine in it, maybe they added it in there. They were also exercising at the same time. They were playing with their diet and they had an underlying condition. So you have all of these combinations, kind of this perfect storm of issues that was going on that was causing some negative results. And by negative, I mean people getting hospitalized, people having long-term uh, problems or possibly dying from it. So again, it wasn't usually, at least from the information that I have seen, it wasn't just this, ephedra or ephedra and caffeine. There were a lot of other things that were going on. With it. But there was enough to say that it was still a problem. So enough, um, Enough people that reported issues or hospitalizations because or stemming from taking ephedra. There was a couple of different products, uh, actual name brand products that were uh, that it was in. Um, Exenadrin and then Hydroxycut. I think Hydroxycut's still on the market. Uh, it used to have ephedra in it, but then they had to take it out. So I think you can still find products with a itty bitty tiny bit of ephedra in it, but it's so low that you would have to take a massive amount of the supplement to actually get it. In fact, uh, about you know, six or seven years after this, I was actually wanting to do a study on ephedra and caffeine. And it was ephedra, caffeine, um, and I, I think we're gonna look at hypoxia. Uh, which is what I did, what I did for my dissertation. So we're going to put it in a hypoxic chamber. So take the oxygen level from what it is here in the room and cut it in half, basically, and see, see what happens. <laughs> so I'm sure that would have been fun. Anyway, so I wanted to see what was going to happen. And my advisor was saying, well, usually there, you find some supplements that have a little bit of ephedra in them. If we can get some of that, we looked and looked and couldn't find any. So I said, well, I'll just go to GNC. She's like, okay, the GNC and vitamin world. I think when I asked them, hey, do you have any products that have a little bit of ephedra in them? I'm just looking, I, mean, I know it's banned, but I just looking for a little bit. They looked at me like they were a drug dealer and I was the FBI. <laughs> because I was undercover trying to see if they had any products in the back room, had some ephedra in it because they're just like, no, I can't. No, no, we don't have any. Get, no. And it was just a hard no that never even asked me any more questions about why I'm looking for it. I tried to tell them and it just kind of cut me off. So and they're probably told if anybody asks for any products like that or any other um, products, possibly even steroids or whatever, it's a hard no. Oh, look like a cop. <laughs> Best friend's a cop, though. So. I have the ends. Uh, actually, he, he does some. But I even do undercover work and more investigation stuff. Is he like that cop from South Park that does the undercover stuff? Cop from South Park. With the, with the orange uh, mustache. Oh, that was the I'm not even going to go into that one. <laughs> Speaking of drug dealers, I mean, he, he has some stories. Crazy people that were actually on meth. Man. So, okay, where were we at? Fed, underlying condition. That's, so I obviously did not get the study done. <laughs> I could not do it. 
strangely enough, we actually proposed, well, we could still have caffeine, and there was a little bit of data on that, but then we actually found another product that we were thinking about uh, studying with hypoxia, uh, because there, there was a couple articles actually written on it. It was actually Viagra uh, and helping with hypoxia, because it's a vasodilator, so it possibly helps. So anyway, but we didn't get that one. I mean, we kind of went a different direction. So let's watch at least the first video here. Oh boy. Probably gonna have to watch a big long stupid ad about something. Go see uh, a doctor at this time. I I found the foods that it looked pretty simple to do and easy. And I was like, you know what? I'm at home. I'm gonna try it. I've seen a, a big difference. I feel better, I feel less bloated. And it was amazing to me that all it took was a small little finger prick to give me that background that I've been looking for, for a while. The message. So I kind of want to investigate that a little bit. Get, get an ad about food sensitivity. I wonder if it works. Okay. New York's attorney general to GNC, Target, Walmart, and Walgreens is clear. Stop selling some store brand supplements because they don't contain what the labels say they contain. These labeled supplements uh, that are taken by the public to preserve or maintain their health pose a significant danger to those who have food allergies or who take medication. The study tested six popular supplements from each retailer using new DNA technology, including ginkgo biloba, <laughs> echinacea, and St. John's wort. 79% of the products did not contain the plants on the label. Another 39% contained ingredients not on the label. The supplement industry accuses the Attorney General of using a testing method roundly criticized by botanical scientists. Well, I think it's premature for consumers to, uh, to get uh, skittish on the market uh, until we have a chance to defend ourselves. Peter Cohen is an expert on supplement on the market uh, until we have a chance to defend ourselves been being worked on over the last 15, 10, 15 years, but it's a different issue when it comes to the botanical products. With the botanical products, it's very complicated to find the right quality DNA in the product to properly identify. So it's not really ready for prime time yet. The debate is bound to create confusion for consumers, and there are a lot of them. An estimated 43 million adults use herbal supplements. It's part of a more than $30 billion industry. Tonight, Walgreens and Target have pulled the products nationwide. GNC did the same in New York, but says they stand by the supplements. Walmart is also complying in New York, but says it will do its own testing to be sure. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. <clears throat> Comments? Surprising number, isn't it? What was it, 70-some percent? Didn't even contain the product. Now, I, I don't know much about the, the DNA testing they were doing, but that has been shown in the past, too. They, th this isn't a new concept where they've tested supplements and the actual product that they are saying is in it is not actually in it, or at least not in the amounts that they said is in it, not what's on the label. Uh, and a lot of times there might even be something in there that they did not disclose. That obviously poses a very big problem, and, and they mentioned it at the beginning, somebody has a food allergy or somebody who has just allergies to any type of product. In, in fact, um, some people have allergies to stuff that is in gum, right? Stuff that actually makes up gum, chewing gum. Um, when I did studies on, on caffeine gum, we actually had to say that if you were allergic to any of the products in the gum, we had to list the, the ingredients, you can't participate in the study. So if they put some sort of product that is in maybe one of those uh, categories into that product and they don't know it and they can have a reaction. All right, Bern. You know, after a quick Google search, you can buy yes, this please. stuff called Mo Wong. Ephedra Sinica, 20 yep. bucks. Unprocessed ephedra. You just get that shipped right to your door, process it, make you a little tea. Jazz! Easy as that one, two, coming three. from Mexico. Is that what's going on? Well, it's got a 98.8% positive feedback from CN Shopping Mall, definitely from China. 
and we'll get into that. In fact, the video, uh, we'll talk about this here. No, no. This is the difference between cultures is that, and someone pointed out in this hearing, the ephedra was used for years, decades, I don't know if it's centuries, but years, kind of like a, uh, like an oriental kind of remedy and uh, boost. Uh, I don't know for longevity, but uh, help with weight loss and stuff. But the products that they would normally have had these low amounts of ephedra, kind of small amounts. But we're America. We tend to have way more products, more of the ingredients in them. It's the same problem sometimes with uh, with steroid use. Steroid use probably, maybe I'm gonna say probably maybe. <laughs> I don't want to get past that line. Maybe okay in some instances for some people, which when they start taking exorbitant amounts of it, and they stop cycling off of it, and that's where it starts to, to get unhealthy. All right. So if you take a little bit, it'll help. But if you take a lot, it must be even better. Right? That's where the ephedra, like I said, me and my buddies did it. You just did not just take. Two pills every you know, six hours or whatever it said to take. We started to take three. Sometimes we take four at a time. That was the problem. We were young and stupid. <laughs> we had no idea. We don't care. Who cares? Right? Um, it was we could also underage. Find someone to buy us a case of beer and. Well, at a pool off on the road somewhere where a cop could just drive by and we're sitting out there drinking beer. 17 years old. Stupid. Anyway, so let's, uh, in this video, at least introduce it. I know, I, I still cannot believe I'm showing a C SPAN video. So, but, a terrace with right. IT problems. So for, uh, again, I'll have the, the link of PowerPoint and everything up on Blackboard. Rails pitcher Steve Beckler died this February after suffering from heat stroke during a practice in Florida. He'd been using a product that contained the dietary supplement ephedra. Over two days, a House subcommittee looked at his death and a few others that might be linked to the supplement. The first day of the hearing is about five and a half hours. 72303. Okay, so what I want you to do for, for next week, we're going to start this. I'll uh, probably short you enough. Try to get through the first hour of it for next week. If you don't get through all of it, it's fine. If you want to watch parts of it, skip around a little bit. Uh, you can if you want. Uh, it is kind of nice to just put the cursor down there. You can kind of see who's talking. Um, the first guy talking actually kind of gives a nice roundabout, uh, I guess, overall gist of what's going on. Um, and then um, the pitcher's mother is, where is she at? Um, this, is, this is her here. And what I want you to do, uh, and I'll put this up on Blackboard too, because uh, maybe it's funny a little bit more, but I want you to write a reaction. How do you, opinions, thoughts on this? Try to get through at least through listening to the mother speak. And then one of the questions I still want to propose as well, and we'll talk about it next week, is are we appealing to emotion? This is sometimes what happens in the public eye in these hearings, congressional hearings, is that there's somebody that was harmed and somebody is crying. There's some facts, there's a lot of facts that are that are here. There's actual scientists um, and, and papers that they're, they're gonna be talking about, but are we appealing to emotion when we ban something because we, we, we feel emotional, uh, the emotional distress of somebody else? And we have that empathy for them. So, question. 
So, that'll be it. Thank you guys for allowing me to walk. <laughs> Thank you.